Hello there. Uh, welcome to another Facebook Live. Um, I'm just, as always, making sure it works. I think this might be my tagline now. Is, uh, is it working? Can you hear me? Then let's jump in. Um, but I can't jump in straight away until I've worked out that you definitely can hear me and see me. So please, if you're, uh, if you're the first in, um, let me know and then we can get this show on the road. Yeah, it's working. Okay, thanks for joining me for another um, reflection on atheism for Lent. Uh, some of you will know that I've been jumping on Facebook Live every day for the last, I think, four days. This is day five. Um, just covering some of the material that we'll be looking at uh, during the course. And um, each day I take a different week. So last week we kind of hit the middle mark and we uh, started to look at the materialist theologians. Now, interestingly, that for a few people, uh, the term materialist um, reflected a, a different kind of argument than the one that I was trying to explore, which is the idea that um, in analytic philosophy, sometimes the word materialism is used to describe a metaphysical view of the world in which there is just an unbroken line of cause and effect uh, back to a non-rational source of the universe. And um, while, some of the th while some of the thinkers I looked at yesterday um, would be materialists, they're not metaphysicians. So it's not that they're making this, these grandiose claims. The thinkers that I was looking at yesterday, uh, which are the Marx and Freud and Nietzsche and Feuerbach, these thinkers, they are trying to think from a material position, i.e. thinking about our thoughts and our brains and our place in society. So they're kind of like opening up the disciplines of sociology and psychology and um, you know, political theory. Uh, they're simply not trying to think from outside the material world or trying to trying to think that they can get access to some knowledge of the uh, what's beyond the physical. Um, they're thinkers who take seriously thinking from the place of thought itself. So anyway, that was that. I probably shouldn't have even mentioned that. Um, it's an interesting uh, kind of distinction if you're interested in philosophy. But I should say that atheism for Lent is not primar primarily an intellectual uh, thing. Um, it definitely is part of that. And I will be giving weekly seminars and they will, you know, get into some of the ideas in a deeper way. But the primary purpose is for something that, yes, feeds the mind, but also, you know, challenges and uproots us in some way at a, at a deeper level. So um, I wanted to take uh, 10, 15 minutes and just talk about where I'm going to go after the kind of 19th century critique of theology and theism. And uh, yesterday I mentioned how I'm trying to be like a cook and every week is a course. And so I want one course to kind of like complement and anticipate the next course. And I want that course to anticipate the next and to look back on what came before. So each week is trying to chart a journey, um, a way of seeing how theism and atheism interlink. And the next week after the materialists um, are what you would could call the existential theologians. Now, uh, that term that, you know, it might not be completely accurate, but they're working with existentialist themes and they're working at mostly at that time when existentialism was um, a, a very vibrant and alive system of thought or a uh, way of thought. So this week we're turning to people like Bonhoeffer, uh, to people like Paul Tillich, to Mary Daly. Um, we're also going to look at a Time magazine. I think it's like the best-selling Time magazine article of all time when they had their front cover, Is, uh, is God Dead? And um, I actually have that. My friend Jay Baker bought me the magazine, and I have it up on my wall. Um, although I, I chew it, but the glass broke, so um, it's currently not on my wall. 
Um, so we've got, we're going to look at this very vibrant time, really a golden age of theology um, was really in that period around the, the kind of mid to late 20th century. And um, what's interesting about them and why I'm pairing them with uh, people like Nietzsche and Marx and Freud and the, these materialist critiques is because uh, the existentialists took it seriously. Um, they... Uh, we're attempting to think and rethink Christianity in what Bonhoeffer would call a religionless way. So the later Bonhoeffer, just before he was executed, uh, he wrote um, a series of letters and thoughts called Letters and Papers from Prison. And in that, he outlined uh, a way of thinking about and understanding faith that transcends religion and theism in its traditional form. And he called it religionless Christianity. So we're gonna, we're gonna look at that. Uh, we're also gonna look at you know, Tillich. Tillich at the very end of his famous book, The Courage to Be, I'm actually gonna read the, the quote. Um, at, the very, at the very end of the book, he says, the courage to be, which means the courage to exist, to affirm one's life, to affirm existence itself. The courage to be, is rooted in the God who appears when God has disappeared in the anxiety of doubt. The courage to be is rooted in the God who appears when God has disappeared in the anxiety of doubt. Now, I gave a full seminar on that uh, a few weeks ago um, on Patreon, um, but I want, we're also going to read that um, in Atheism for Lent. And in a nutshell, what he's kind of saying is that the traditional God uh, dies, but, there is, but that death of this very tr traditional notion of God, this popular notion of God, through that death, a, a deeper and richer understanding um, of God arises um, or experience of God arises. And I'll just reflect on that briefly and then you'll have to sign up to the course to get all the stuff right uh, and to hear me talk about it for an hour. But um, he is saying that, uh, that basically this, um, if you doubt and ask questions of your faith in your life, first of all, he thinks that's a human thing. He thinks it's particularly um historically significant from the kind of 19th and 20th century. And he says, in fact, that, you know, it, it's very difficult to, in good faith, uh, hold a political or religious system without having questions about it. But he says that when we do this, at first it can be experienced as very negative. So if you're, say, a conservative Christian and you're questioning the whole notion of God that you grew up with and you've read some of the great critiques and you see a real depth in those critiques, then at first that can feel like your whole life is falling apart. It can feel like everything is disappearing. The ground beneath your feet is dissolving away. But what Tillich does is Tillich doesn't um, do something like either, you know, God's great kind of like en enter into that type of nihilism, nor does he say, no, we can kind of get beyond this questioning or we can overcome it with, you know, better answers. What he does is he positivizes the negativity, um, which is kind of Nietzsche's way as well. He basically says that the very questioning of meaning and the very questioning of, of if anything makes sense and if your past makes sense and your beliefs make sense, in that very questioning of truth, you're showing a dedication to truth and to meaning because you care enough to ask the questions, you care enough to be authentic, you want to have the courage to be able to embrace the truth, whatever that is, even if it confronts you, even if it breaks you apart. And so Tillich says, so in that you're affirming reality, you're affirming life, you're affirming authenticity and meaning and depth. And so in that, he says, you're affirming God. Um, sorry, my phone beeped. I want to turn it off. Um, you're affirming. You're affirming the ground of being. So for Tillich, um, if you believe in God and you affirm that belief, uh, and you look at all the good things that have been done in the name of God and the name of church, 
and then someone else doesn't believe in God and they see very clearly all the terrible and horrific things that have been done in the name of God and name of church. Tillich says that both of these individuals um, are affirming authenticity, they're affirming meaning, they're affirming care and concern for the world. And so both are affirming what he calls the ontological God, what Bonhoeffer would call the religionless God. Now, this isn't just the return of God under a different name. It's a very different way of believing entirely. That's not epistemological, it's not in your mind. It's that the truth of faith is a type of affirmation of the ground of reality through a love, a care, and a concern for concrete reality. So what they do, is, if you see this, is they take the materialist critique, they take it seriously, and they say that in the very seriousness of the critique, there is um, an affirmation that can be called faith. Now, what it isn't, and I have to clarify this, is this is not Tillich trying to catch somebody out. You know, the old first year philosophy thing or high, you know, kids in high school talk about, well, if you say there is no truth, then you're making a truth claim. So you do believe there's truth, right? So you're in a logical contradiction. Or if you say that life isn't meaningful, well, you're making a meaningful statement. Therefore, you think it is. That's not what Tillich means. Um, that no philosopher's ever fallen for that. That's just a little kind of logical puzzle that you, that you hear in first year philosophy to kind of get your mind working. But Tillich's not saying that because he's talking about people who in good faith are not saying there is no truth or no meaning. They're just saying that the meaning and the truth that I have encountered kind of crumbles uh, whenever I interrogate it. And actually, every time I interrogate the truth, what people call the truth, I see that it's deconstructible. I see that, it's, that it has a history, that it has a language, that it has a tradition, and that all of those are deconstructible. And so Tillich's saying, for someone like that, it's not like a got you. It's just saying what you're doing is courageous and beautiful and should be encouraged. And then for Tillich, the church is the place that actually draws you into that type of questioning, uh, cradles you within it and affirms it. It, it. He says like the church shouldn't be the place that answers those questions. It is the place where those questions uh, are felt, that those questions animate our lives that we're not concerned with our happiness or anything like that. We're drawn to um, a pursuit of depth and truth. And of course, you know, out of that comes a certain joy and a certain experience of depth of life. But it's kind of in losing the very interest in that stuff and getting caught up in, in the questioning itself. Genuine questioning is a real affirmation of life. So what I want to do in this week is you will get readings and reflections from these different thinkers. Oh, you know, they'll take you 20 minutes or less to kind of go through. Um, and then I'll give a seminar kind of drawing out these themes in more depth. But what you'll see in all of the reflections is this notion that, that it is in the losing of God, because Bonhoeffer has his own way of saying what Tillich said. He said to live as though God is not given is to live fully before God and with God. In other words, to live as though God is not given as an object, but rather to give yourself to the world, you discover that you're in the heart of God. That's kind of his, his way of saying it. Um, so in this, you'll see what holds these thinkers together is this commitment to materiality, uh, this commitment to affirmation, care, and concern for the world that is evidenced in real involvement in the world it's very very that's very important to Tillich is that he feels that uh, you know what we do in our lives is we we affirm the, the world but often in very limited ways through neurotics or whatever obsessives is you might be able to affirm the world but you're afraid to go out at night or you you can't fall asleep at night unless you've locked all the doors and triple checked or you can't leave the house until the garage is in the perfect order so you're affirming life, but it's in a limited way. It's keeping you from affirming life in a, in a broader sense. And for Tillich, faith and the practices of faith are designed to try to expand your affirmation of life uh, beyond yourself and the confines of your home or whatever through to um, 
some sort of like, not some ideal of you affirm life in its entirety, but just that your experience of life is widened and deepened and your interaction with your neighbor is deepened. Um, and this is a type of faith that takes seriously atheism and at its most radical because it's not arguing for an epistemological God. This is why a lot of the existentialists say, existential theologians will say that there is an atheism closer to God. Uh, Simone Weil, I think we're looking at Weil this week as well. But, you know, she looks at this as well, this idea that there is an atheism that is a purification and the purification gets us to something deeper beyond both atheism and theism, something that encompasses and transcends that dichotomy. Um, so anyway, there you go. There are some thoughts on this. Um, I will leave you. Oh, no, I'll look and see if you've got any questions. Uh, and while I'm reading about your questions, I'll let you know as well that I've been working the last couple of days on my Wake Festival, which is the highlight of my year. I think I've got a lot of highlights of my year because I always say like atheism for Lent's one as well. Um, and then this Holy Shift tour is one of them. But um, my go-to, I've been doing it for every year for six years now, is Wake Festival in Northern Ireland, where we get like between 80 and 100 people for five days of just hanging out together, drinking, doing uh, uh, art stuff, live music, uh, philosophy, theology. And uh, it's, a, it's a weird kind of like a, a festival of dangerous ideas. Um, so uh, I've been working on that, very excited about it. If you'd like to know more, just jump on my website and uh, you'll find out. And let me see, any questions? Now, I'm not sure I was the most clear in my presentation today, so I apologize for that, but let's see if it's inspired any of your questions. Oh, well, Jenna, thank you so much. I was just saying that I was a bit insecure. I felt that I didn't give my best to you today, but you just said you're surprised by how much you needed to hear that. So that's lovely. I mean, mind you, the truth is, no matter how bad somebody is, if there's enough people listening, it will still impact somebody who isn't, you know, that's connected to. So um, it's not enough to make me think that I am going to win an award for this, but I appreciate it. <laughs> oh, another thing I should say is I'm starting a podcast. It's very exciting. Um, this is really huge for me. Is that So my great friend and housemate is a guy called Elliot Morgan, and he's a comedian, a YouTuber. And we often sit up at night uh, drinking and talking about life. He's a comedian with a love of philosophy, and I'm a philosopher with a love of comedy. And we both have an interest in the same kind of ideas around theology and philosophy and analysis. So we thought, well, why do we not just record some of these conversations? There's probably some people out there dumb enough to want to listen, you know, to, to kind of be part of our late night conversation. And um, actually, we recorded one or two and we're like, oh, this is really fun. This is informal. This is chilled out. But we get to some interesting issues. And then sometimes we talk about nonsense. And it really felt that this might be something that a different way to to kind of create free content that I can be proud of, um, that I would like you to invite you to be part of. So that's called, we're called the fundamentalists and it starts on Sunday. And uh, whenever I have the link details, I'll uh, let you know them, but yeah, that is coming. So there you go. Thanks very much for listening in. Um, I hope you have a good day wherever you are. And um, I'm going to click in, I think two more days I'm going to do tomorrow day after. And then, um, and then basically on the 14th, we kick off with the official Atheism for Lent. So I will see some of you for that. Take care. Bye-bye.